Welcome to The Volley, a podcast by tennis majors, bringing you in-depth insights into tennis's latest hot topics from the tennis majors team. We are back on The Volley, a podcast by tennis majors. I'm your host, Max Whittle, and today we are talking about something that most tennis fans know a lot about, but equally something that has rarely happened throughout history. That is the tennis Grand Slam, winning the Australian Open, Roland Garros, Wimbledon and the US Open in the same calendar year. Here at Tennis Majors, it's not all about the calendar Grand Slam, of course. We are dedicated to chatting about all the latest tennis news via digital media, bringing you video, debate and news from the tennis world. So, no man has achieved this rare feat since Rod Laver in 1969, and on the women's side, Steffi Graf was the last to clean sweep back in 1988. In total, five players have achieved it, but Novak Djokovic, having won the first three Grand Slams in 2021, has given tennis history books and all its storytellers hope that we are on the precipice of another. If Djokovic goes on to win the US Open, what would it mean for his career when compared against the all-time greats? And will we ever see a player get this close again? And while the Serbian is the headliner today, those that have come before him in this story, Don Budge in 1938, Maureen Connolly in 1953, Rod Laver in 62 and 69, Margaret Court in 1970, and Steffi Graf in 1988 must be celebrated on this episode. Joining me on the volley today to cover all the bases is sports journalist and broadcaster Simon Campbell. Simon, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you very much. Just enjoying the last throes of summer. Yes, yes, the last few days before before autumn. We love autumn, though, don't we? It's nice, yeah, it is good, all good. Good. So our topic today, achieving a Grand Slam, something neither of us have done, um, the four major tournaments are all more than 100 years old, but only five players have achieved the Grand Slam in singles by winning all four, of course, in the same year. Mr. Cambers, just how hard is this to pull off? Well, this is the uh, the cherry on the top of the icing on the cake, isn't it? It's it's so, so difficult. I think you just got to... It's, it's the ultimate achievement in, in tennis. Winning all four Grand Slams in the same year, something iconic about, you know, that, that calendar year Grand Slam. Uh, it's been coveted for so long by so many people and most people have got nowhere near it. And that includes some of the greatest players we've ever seen play tennis. So, yeah, it's it's the hardest thing to achieve in the game. Uh, courtesy of the New York Times, here's the history lesson for everyone. The term Grand Slam entered sports in the 20th century via contract bridge, which I hadn't heard of before. It's a card game in which a Grand Slam meant winning the maximum 13 tricks. And of course, nowadays, the term is used in sports such as baseball to describe a home run with the bases loaded, golf, and of course, for what we're talking about today, tennis. Um, back to the tennis, of course, Simon, because I can't, I can't go on with that for too long. Steffi Graf was the last to achieve the Grand Slam in 1988. And during her career... She was world number one for 377 weeks. She won 22 slams. As we try and contextualize this Djokovic attempt and those who've done it before, where do you think Graf's 88 run ranks against her other career achievements? Well, I mean, you, as you say, she she is a phenomenal player. I mean, she was anyone who had the pleasure to watch her. Well, it didn't last long, usually. It took about 45 minutes, most of her matches. Um, she was so dominant. That fantastic forehand, the incredible movement she had. Um, and inner self-belief to make yourself a champion. I mean, winning the Grand Slam in 88, and it was a Golden Slam too, of course, don't forget, with the Olympics, which actually came after the US Open that year um, in Seoul, uh, was a phenomenal achievement, and even more so when you think she was 19. You know, this was uh, this was Graf not even yet at her best. I, I'm not sure 88 was her best year. I would say maybe, you know, a couple of years later, she was even more dominant just before Monica Seles came along. But... Yeah, I mean, doing it after, and it was 18-year gap between Margaret Court, the last woman to do it before she did. And you think in that time of the players who were around at the top of the game who couldn't do it, Martina Navratilova, Chris Evert, um, and it just shows you how difficult it was to do. So, yeah, I mean, incredible, incredible achievement. It's that consistency that you have to have on all surfaces, um, peaking at least four times a year, um, over seven matches in each slam. It's an incredible achievement when you think about it. 
Yeah, the margin for error is so thin. And, and just so I can make what Novak Djokovic is trying to do sound even harder, aside from Don Budge, who will talk about Rod Laver and Djokovic, only two other men, Jack Crawford in 1933 and Lou Hode in 1956, even won the first three slam events in a calendar year. And I read today, I, I, I can't imagine this is true, but neither apparently neither Federer or Nadal have ever won the first two slams in a calendar year during their careers, which... If that's true, that's shocking, to be honest. Well, it's, it's, it's partly because, I mean, uh, you, when you think about it, Nadal only won one Australian Open. That was 2009. And that was the year Federer won his only uh, Roland Garros. So it actually works out like that. I mean, had it happened other years, they would have won it a couple of times. But um, And of course, had they not played at the same time as each other, they probably would have done it many times. If I win a, a Roland Garros in, the, in that year, I have a good chance to... To maybe maybe do it in all in four same year, you know, calendar calendar slam. And I've, after I won Paris this year, I felt like okay, I like my chances on grass. I won two Wimbledon's in a row. Approaching you know approaching Wimbledon, I feel like I've improved over the years on grass, and um, and 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 it did not seem impossible anymore, you know, to 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 go for all four in a row in the same year. So here I am. I'm in in a in a good position to do that. Um, still in the tournament, but um, we have got to take take one match at a time. When do you think Djokovic started thinking about the calendar Grand Slam? I asked him this actually um, just before the U.S. Open. I asked him, you know, when when he thought that he was capable of doing it, and I I actually meant when in his career did he think that he was the kind of player who could maybe do it. But I think he understood it. Uh, maybe I didn't get it, my message across clear enough, but he understood it as when this year did he think he could do it? And his answer was straight after winning Roland Garros. I think that was the big one. It's it's stands to reason. I mean, he'd only won it once before. Nadal had been so dominant on clay in Paris. So once uh, Djokovic won in Paris, I think he thought and he said as much to me. He said, "I you know I was tired going to Wimbledon, but I knew that that I could win there." And I knew that I probably would if I if I played my best or anywhere near it. I don't think he did even play his best at Wimbledon. That's the great thing from his point of view. But he, he got the job done. And now, of course, he has to deal with all the immense pressure that goes along with trying to finish off finish off this slam. I mean, the, the person who got closest in recent years was Serena Williams, of course, in 2015. And I'm sure that a lot of listeners will remember what happened to her, the pressure was ramping up with each round. And then she she ran into Roberta Vinci, who nobody gave a chance in that match. No one. And Vinci played a great match, but probably nothing different to the way she would have played many, many times in the past. But it was good enough to beat Serena, who was as tight as a drum that day. Yeah, you mentioned that Serena semi-final loss and the pressure that it comes with. We all saw how frustrated Djokovic was at the Olympics in Tokyo when he failed to win a medal Perhaps that unbelievable golden slam run is, is is obviously going through his mind there. Have you noticed any additional pressure in his game at the US Open? Well, I mean you can you can read a lot of things into a lot of a lot of things that we see and, and you can you can be right and you can be wrong. It's it's really hard to be sure of how someone's feeling when you're not inside their heads. I'm sure he's feeling a lot of pressure. The fact that he's dropped a set in each of these or in three of the four matches he's played so far. And would suggest that it's not all plain sailing, and you know what the what pressure does is that when you're when you're in a situation in a match where you're in difficulty, it adds to the difficulty of getting out of it. And he's he's become so so good at getting out of difficult situations in his career, and he's someone who thrives on adversity. Let's face it. Well, I I read a stat the other day, and I haven't checked it, but I'm sure it's correct. He's never won a Grand Slam, Novak Djokovic, of his twenty slams without dropping a set. So he's never he's never been totally calm and plain sailing throughout it. Somewhere along the line in this US Open, you would expect that he'll have a really difficult match. You'd also expect that he'd get out of it because he does it so often. Anyone could cause that pressure to amp up even more and then then you sort of then it's it's when the demons can come out and it's whether he can cope with that and keep himself calm enough to get over the line. I really enjoyed reading about the other players who have achieved the Grand Slam, and given they were rather a long time ago, slightly different journeys to Djokovic's. Um, American Don Budge, for example, actually had to turn down becoming a professional. This was back in the 30s, of course, which would have made him ineligible for Grand Slam tournaments. And when he won all four, he, he did so with an abscessed tooth. I read that today. He was on a boat for two weeks just to get to the Australian Open 
and his final in the US was delayed almost a week because of a hurricane. Now, I don't know what Novak's dental hygiene is like, Simon, but I know there are private jets and arena roofs these days. So this is all quite hard to compare, especially when you remember that Lever did it. Three of the four slams were played on grass back then. So how do we compare what Djokovic might do with, with the past? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fun pub chat, isn't it? Who's the best player? Who's the greatest? Or it's the same, it's the same as who's the GOAT, the GOAT. Um, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I don't think you can compare eras perfectly. Um, you, there'll be a lot of people who will say that it is more difficult now to do it because the depth is better. That's definitely true. Um, than when Lever was winning it in 62 and 69 and when Don Budge in 38, of course. Um, but, uh, and also the fact that it's, uh, you know, you've got to play on hard clay and grass, three different surfaces out of four, whereas, whereas as you said, it was three grass court majors up until the late 70s. So, or until Australia turned hard courts in 1988 was the last one to go. Um, I don't know. I think it's an, it's it's just a phenomenal achievement in terms of, yeah, I mean, you could you could say on the other side of it, you could say that for, as you said, in terms of how Budge got to the tournaments, Lever in 62 and stuff, they got on the boat from Australia um, with all the Davis Cup team together, all the Aussies that were playing together at that time. And they were away for six, eight months in a year. And, you know, the, the in terms of how tired they must have been when they got there, I find that really interesting. But they, they kept fit on the boat. They played tennis. They swam. They did everything. Um you know, whereas Novak obviously has the luxury of being able to jet around the world if he wants to um, and not have jet lag problems as much as others would in that sense. So maybe there are some things that are easier. But, you, you know, then you, then again, in his case, he's been playing the whole of his career with Nadal and Federer around. Yes, they're at the end of their career, certainly Federer now. But for a long period of his time, he was stuck at number three and he had to wait. He had to bide his time and he did it. And for him to get to this point where he's got 20 slams and trying to win this calendar slam, I think is amazing. What what for, for me with Novak, it's all about motivation. You know, for a long time, he wanted to get above those two. He wanted to show that he could beat them in Grand Slam finals. He did that. He wanted to catch them at 20. A lot of people thought he wouldn't do that. He's done that. He's, gonna, he's probably going to go past them, it seems. And that motivation to do something that they have not done win the calendar year Grand Slam is I think the one thing keeping him going more than anything. He, he's bound to be tired. He's bound to be experiencing a lot of pressure. But the inner motivation he has, the drive and the determination is is second to none. Yeah, I guess I'm talking about Djokovic now, but what is the hardest thing facing the modern tennis player today, do you think? In terms of trying to do the Grand Slam? Yeah, the stamina to do this. Yeah, I think it's I think it's peaking four times a year when the depth of the field is is so strong I mean, we've seen you know we've seen this US Open really with some of the youngsters finally coming through Carlos Alcaraz I mean what a what a breakthrough he's had you know some other really good players right up there so it is becoming more and more difficult Djokovic is not getting any younger he is 35 next year I mean to do this at the age of 34 I think is is, is something almost uh, unthinkable you know it's hard to fathom how he can be Achieving this stuff while he's well into his 30s, which back in the day would have been a time when you'd been long retired. Um, it is it is an amazing effort. And it is very, very hard because physically the game these days is so much more brutal. Look how many five set matches we've seen at the US Open this year. 33, I think, to date, um, which is second only to I think 34 is the all time record in the open era. Um, so there are a lot of things that go against you and the pressure and social media and you know, every single question being related to him chasing records and what he's doing, it it is it must be very hard to stay in the moment and just stay calm. And as you said, the stamina required, the physical stamina to do it. One thing that uh, I I know I know I've known is true for a long time, um, and I saw the stat uh, put in the uh, New York Times article that you mentioned. I find this amazing. Rod Laver won it in '69, the Slam, the second Grand Slam. And then never reached another final in a slam. That's that to wow. me is amazing. I know there was some he had some elbow issues that maybe were worse than he let on at first, but he was still the dominant player in the world in the next couple of years. But he never got to another slam final. And you wonder, you know, it's easy to speculate. You wonder what Novak will go on to do if he does go on and win the U.S. Open. 
Roach tried to make the shot. Roach is down in every respect. He is the loser. And Rod Haber has won it. He's the slammer. The grand slammer and Jack Kramer next to me applauding. We gotta do it. We gotta clap for that. The grand slam and it's undoubtedly the finest achievement in the history of this game. Well, Labour there, you mentioned he since said that he targeted the Grand Slam. He did it twice, 62 and 69. What what does our audience need to know about him? When he first came along, he was considered too small to play tennis. You know, he was told by a lot of people that he was not good enough and he was his physically he just wasn't able to cope with some of these uh, big hitters in, in Australia. I mean, he came along at the beginning, well, he, when, at the beginning of his career was right in the middle of a golden era of Australian tennis. I mean, Australian tennis in the 50s and 60s in, on the men's side was absolutely dominant. Um, you know, you look back and you look at all the players, uh, Lou Hode, Roy Emerson, later on Tony Roach, John Newcomb into the 70s, you know, many, many more who, whose names I'll forget as I try to remember them now. Um, he was the youngster on the team, Neil Fraser. You know, these guys, Neil Fraser was Davis Cup captain when he first came in. Um, he was the youngster on the Davis Cup team. He was always considered a little bit lightweight, but he managed to win... As some of those guys turned professional, he won the Grand Slam in 62. But when he turned professional, um, he realised, the first thing he realised, that he had to get physically stronger. Uh, so he became a really great athlete after, maybe maybe after the first slam, I think it's probably fair to say. By the time that he won it in 69, I was speaking to Cliff Drysdale, um, the former uh, top player from South Africa, U.S., who um, has been a leading commentator on ESPN for many, many years. And he beat Laver at the US Open in 1968. When he, he actually tells you, he'll tell the story that it was on sort of a bog of a grass court. And if you let the ball bounce, you're in deep trouble. So he won that way. But it's still a great win. And then the next year, he was there when Laver was trying to win in 69. And he said Laver, by that stage, was so totally dominant. You know, he's a lefty, brilliantly quick around the court, lovely touch, serve volleyer. Uh, beautiful backhand as well, had all the all the tools required and the mental strength to to get it done the same way Djokovic is, is doing these days. And he you know, he won on, on largely on grass. I think being a left-hander on grass helped him a lot. Um, but he was that nippy player around the court. And Ken Rosehall was another Australian great, of course, at the time. He beat him in several Grand Slam finals. Uh, Rosehall never won Wimbledon, mostly because of Lever. And the point that Cliff Drysdale made was that you know, had Laver not turned professional when he did, how many more slams would he have won? I mean, it's it's anyone's guess, and he may well have done another Grand Slam. Well, speaking of that dominance, Maureen Connolly, one of three women to do this as well, she lost just one set when she won all four majors in 1953, which is bonkers. Uh, Adam, Emma Raducanu-esque, I must say. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether this is a fair question, and I, I, you did touch on it, but I'm not sure I got your opinion. So is it harder to win a calendar Grand Slam in today's game? I think it probably is if you factor in all the all the things we were talking about. The, the stamina required is probably the same, but you're on different courts. It's harder to win clay, hard, and grass than just gr- three grass and clay. Um, there, the depth in the in the men's game is way greater than it's ever been. Um, the level at the top has been supreme for the last twenty years with the three, the big three, and Andy Murray and. The likes of Stan Wawrinka, who's won three slams as well. So I think it probably is a little bit harder. When you talk about Maureen Connolly, I mean, she was a phenomenon of a player. When you look back and you read stories about how good she was, um, it's a crying shame that she had a horse riding accident when she was 19 and never played again and died tragically very young. Um, But she would have won many, many, many more. So I I don't know. I think it is is more difficult now, but it's obviously an incredible achievement whenever it's done. And you mentioned Serena Williams coming close in 2015 before losing that US Open semi-final. She's won four slams in a row twice, um, now dubbed the Serena slams, not in the same calendar year. Those are a little bit different. How are those viewed compared to the calendar Grand Slam? Yeah, they don't get anywhere near as much um, uh, love in the media or in the in the sort of tennis historical world. I mean, I think Navratilova did it as well and um also obviously Novak did it in 2016 when he won the Roland Garros that completed four in a row um I don't know it's it's a brilliant achievement to win four in a row whenever they are but you do get that break at the end of the year 
however short it is, where everybody gets to reset. And I just think it's difficult to 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 go to start a year and to go all the way through it. And, you know, you have that, all the things that are going on in the year with the rankings changing and everything that goes with it. I just think a calendar year has that magic, that sort of mystique about it that a four in a row outside of the same calendar year doesn't. What's your favourite magical tale about just Djokovic chasing this has there been a an anecdote that you've you've gotten this year or something that you've read about the past we talked about these players that have already done it is there something that you you look back on uh, that's a good question um I don't know I, I I like I like the idea that he only really thought he could do it after Roland Garros but I I I sort of don't believe him I, I reckon he believed he could do it at the start of the year you know because he's had Phenomenal starts to the year in the past. That 2011, when he sort of turned tennis on its head and won three out of four slams. Um, if it hadn't have been for Roger Federer playing out of his mind on clay in that semi final uh, at Roland Garros, Djokovic may well have won all four that year. Um, I think he probably had an inkling right at the start of this year, as soon as he won Australia. I remember, he didn't win Australia in easy circumstances. It was a tough final. He was nursing an injury all the way through it. Um, then I think once he did that and he thought, well, if I can do it this way and if I can, you know, there are maybe, there is maybe some weakness in Nadal this year. Maybe I could win Roland Garros. Then he, the, 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 uh, the sort of seeds of thought were, were coming into his mind early, I think. Is there a player on tour currently that will get this close before they retire? That's such an impossible question to answer, isn't it? Um, uh, it's, I mean, it, well... The, the one thing they'll have in their favour on the men's side is that uh, there'll be no Djokovic, Nadal and Federer to deal with. So the the sort of the the strength at the top won't be the same. I think you'll see, we talked about this before, haven't we? I think we'll see uh, Grand Slam shared around for a little bit in the men's game until someone does start to dominate. And maybe it'll be a Carlos Alcaraz. You know, maybe it'll be someone we haven't even thought of yet. Um if someone starts to dominate, then the fact that there is no triumvirate at the top of unbelievable players, um, you know, truly world greats of all time, then maybe somebody could. But they've, it's got to be someone, again, who's rounded enough to be able to win Paris against some of the clay court experts. Someone who has an all-court game. And, uh, you know, I was listening to the Carlos Alcaraz uh, podcast you did with Sasha Osmo and that's one of the things they talk about and he was talking about with with uh, Carlos, isn't it? That he's an all-round player and that's what you've got to be to be to be able to win the Grand Slam. You can't just be all-out aggressor. You've got to be a tactician. You've got to be, you've got to have mental strength. You've got to be able to figure things out when things are not going your way and you've got to be able to cope with adversity, cope with injuries. Um, just staying fit long enough to be competing for four majors in a year is is an amazing achievement. So, Thinking about the youngsters coming through, it's very hard to see anyone doing it right now. But, you know, over the next few years, we'll see someone emerge probably who comes out of the pack to take control. It usually happens. It might take a while, but it'll happen. Rod, Rod Laver plans to be in New York to hand Novak Djokovic the trophy if he does win. What do you think he'll say to Novak? Welcome to the club, maybe. I'm sure he'll... Uh, I'm sure he'll be very happy to uh, to have him in the in the in a very very elite club that he that he started in an open era at least and on the men's side. Um, it's funny when you think about it when he first when he won in '69 and then Margaret Court won in 1970. It probably felt like it was a really easy thing to do from the outside, but then you see the gaps since, and you realise what goes into getting to this point. I, It'll be really interesting. Yeah, I know Rod is um, invited to the semis and the finals, and obviously if Novak's in it then he would be presenting the trophy. Well, Simon, we're going to find out. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens and, and if this can actually happen again. Maybe in 20 years' time, we'll have another podcast talking about the same topic. So a big thank you to Simon Cambers for joining us on The Volley. Make sure you check out his work over at tennismajors.com and stick with us here on the podcast, which you can listen to on Spotify and all main media platforms. Take care, everyone. <laughs>